And up first tonight, I'm very excited to have this person on this stage. She again is a new speaker. Uh, here to present to you the story of how the Cornor became the Queen's Diamond, stand-up comedian, and host of the Moth SF right here on the stage once a month. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Daya Lakshmi Narayanan. Sure. You can have both drinks, why not? Oh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna adjust this uh, because I'm even smaller than Christian. So see, I, you, that's why he selected me as a speaker first. So I got to adju adjust, adjust down, right? I know. Uh, thank you uh, to thank you to Christian. Yep. Good. Good. Right there. Position before. Thank you. Thank you. Did I get right? Yes. Okay. Uh, give a round of applause for Christian for being one of the only people to say my name right. I kept my name when my parents immigrated. Uh, I refused to change it, so I'm very happy to be presenting on this. Um, so uh, let's start by saying that, you know, typically, you know, in the West, when we think of India, what do we think of? Slums. That's Slumdog Millionaire and Mother Teresa looking very sad. Weird animals. Uh, I don't know what that thing is in her hand. It looks like a big snake. And that thing in the right, uh, like a cat uh, and mongoose and cobra and colorful camels and elephants. We also think of skinny men or Gandhi. Same thing. Uh, but uh, this uh, perception of India is fairly recent. India used to be a country of uh, jewelry, uh, marble, mansions, uh, exotic uh, places that you could go and uh, trips. It used to be a country of a lot of wealth. Uh, during the Mughal period, uh, the GDP of India was about 25% of the world's economy. The British occupied India from 1858 to 1947. This is what it looked like in 1950. So you can see what the United States looks like in 1950. Uh, that's what India used to be. So think about how big of an economic engine the United States is now. That's what India used to be. India had its people forcibly exported. So you can see from this map, uh, Indians didn't just go to the United States and to Silicon Valley. Uh, <laughs> Not just to England, uh, but also uh, because of, uh, you know, uh, the abolition of slavery in the British Empire, Indians were taken to places like the Fiji Islands to work on sugarcane plantations, the uh, West Indies and the Caribbean, South Africa. Gandhi was actually in South Africa and he got kicked off the train. So uh, Indians have been part of the labor class and indentured servant class for a long time, too. India has had its religions appropriated. I have never felt that watery quality in my pelvis while doing yoga, by the way. That person on the, the very right, by the way, her actual name is Gangaji. That's her name. Her name is Gangaji. Uh, and she's the, I, I've been to her seminar. She's like the whitest person ever. Uh, and the Hare Krishnas, of course, we know them from um, SFO, LAX, and other airports. But I want to make sure it's not just white people who appropriate in country. Trap yoga is happening now, uh, the very bottom right. So... India's had its treasures stolen. Basically the entirety of the British Museum, if you've ever been there. The most famous of these treasures is the Kohinoor diamond. So the word Kohinoor is not actually a word from any Indian languages. There's 22 major Indian languages, many more dialects. Uh, it's, from, uh, it's Ko from mountain and Noor from light, like, remember Queen Noor? So it's actually an Arabic slash Persian, Persian word. Uh, this, uh, this, a lot of people are like, well, what, where did the Kohinoor come from? There's a lot of mythology around it. Some people say it's the Syamantaka gem, which uh, you can see in this picture is being handed to Krishna. Krishna is an avatar of Vishnu, uh, also a patron saint of the Hare Krishnas, who you met at airports. Uh, <laughs> The Syamantaka gem was uh, worn by the sun god Surya, who wore it around his neck. And, and everyone thought, wow, he's pretty blinged out. Uh, 
And he's a god. He should be. So uh, Surya somehow gave it to this king named King uh, Sutterajit. And when he was wearing the diamond, everyone thought he was Surya. Except for Krishna, who's like, mm, you just dress like a god. You're not actually a god. And he figured it out. So then Krishna came into possession of this Syamantaka gem. Uh, and then, uh, you know, later on, uh, people stole it from him. People died. So these diamonds, these gems, were not just valued for their usefulness and beauty. They were auspicious objects. They could channel planetary influences. These diamonds themselves were given semi-divine status as gemstones, but also as protectors. Another thing that we think of when we think of India is not call center, <laughs> Taj Mahal. <laughs> Uh, and many of you might know the Taj Mahal was created by this guy, Shah Jahan, uh, on the left, for his wife, um, Mumtaz Mahal. Mumtaz died while giving birth to the 13th child, and he was so struck with grief that he built the Taj Mahal in her honor. And it took, uh, and there was all sorts of mythology that he had people's thumbs cut off so they couldn't replicate the designs. He had people blinded, buried. He gave away bricks from the scaffold so no, it couldn't be recreated. But what's interesting about Shah Jahan is not just the Taj Mahal. He had this peacock throne. And at the very top of the peacock throne, the Kohinoor diamond was supposedly a part of it. Now, Shah Jahan wasn't the first person to have the Kohinoor diamond, nor was he the last person. But he was one of the most famous people to have it. That brings us to this guy. Uh, he's, he's a Maharaj Ranjit Singh. He was the ruler of Punjab. Punjab is the breadbasket of India where most of the Sikhs come from in India. He uh, was kind of a baller because he had the Kohinoor diamond put on an armband and wore it around his bicep. Like, that is how cut he is. He is cut like a diamond, ladies and gentlemen. So he just wore it around town like, hey, look at my bicep, this is my diamond. Uh, and his um, people wanted him, his priests wanted him to donate it to the temple. So he was like, okay, fine, when I die, I want it to go to the temple. However, the British had other plans. When the Maharaj died, five of his successors also passed away in awful deaths, which left this guy, Duleep Singh, his youngest son and successor. He took the throne at 10 years old. His mom, Rani, had been forcibly removed and incarcerated outside of the palace. And on March 29, 1849, this 10-year-old Maharaj of Punjab was ushered into this mirror throne room at the center of this great fort of Lahore. And he found himself by these grave-looking white men wearing red coats and plumed hats who talked in an unfamiliar language. He spoke no English. And the terror that happened right after that would forever be known as the Crimson Day. Uh, he was frightened into signing what is called the Act of Submission, which from its title, you know it's not a fair treaty, right? <laughs> the terms were so punitive uh, that within minutes, the Sikh flags came down and the British colors were raised. And to add insult to injury, C-O-L-O-U-R-S, colors, were raised up. <laughs> Part of uh, what Article 3 of the document said was, the gem called the Kohinoor shall be surrendered by the Maharaj of Lahore to the Queen of England. Just like that, a 10-year-old boy signed a piece of paper and the diamond left India. Who did it go to? This guy. Uh, forgive me, I don't know how to say his name, Lord Dalhousie. Uh, English names are very complicated for me. I can't pronounce them exactly right. Um, but I will do the best I can. Uh, I want, could I call him something easier like Lord Ganesh or something? That, that's easier for me to say. Uh, when the document was finally said, he triumphantly said, I have now caught my hair, H-A-R-E. Uh, the Kohinoor has become in the lapse of ages a sort of historical emblem of conquest of India. It has now found its proper resting place. Uh, so this guy had titles like, uh, you know, uh, Lord and Earl and Governor General. What this all means is that he worked for this, the East India Company. He, uh, yeah, yeah, you can, you can hiss that, yes. The East India Company was sort of the world's first global multinational company. It, was, it started off as like this little startup, uh, employing only 35 people, no VC funding at all. 
headquartered in a small office in London, but then it became a heavily militarized corporation. Its army by 1800 was twice the size of the army of Britain. So that's like saying like Exxon suddenly shows up to the White House with its army and is buying favors from, oh, never mind, that's happening. So, um, <laughs> So the East India Company would take possession of this jewel. And before the, the East India Company and Lord Dalhousie took possession of the jewel, the Lord sent a, a letter to this guy named Theo Metcalf and asked Theo to provide some research. So if you, and if you want to, after this talk, the Wikipedia entry for the Kohinoor diamond is mostly made up of Delhi Bazaar gossip. The reason is because of Theo Metcalf because he basically uh, was known as the kind of person who could cut corners and uh, he uh, didn't, he liked dogs and enjoyed cocktails. He wasn't a meticulous person. And so when he presented his report, he said, what I lack in specifics, I make up in color. C-O-L-O-U-R, by the way. <laughs> so basically everything he presented about the diamond's history was kind of made up or he just invented it, but he had a job. So remember the guy, the armband guy who I told you about? Uh, before him, a guy named Nader Shah had the Kohinoor diamond. And Theo Metcalf said the way it came from Nader Shah to uh, Maharaj Ranjit Singh was they were involved in an elaborate turban swapping kind of uh, play. Uh, and that's how the diamond came to be, which is one of the falsehoods that you'll read in Wikipedia. Uh, first of all, uh, it's not possible for this turban swapping to occur because as a person of Indian origin, uh, the turban is kind of attached to your hair. So it's not like a three card money, you just take it off and you get a shell game and then, oh look, diamond, God, I'm gonna wear it on my head. Like, People wear turbans aren't hiding like something precious like a diamond or a can of Coke or something that they want to conceal. It's like part of your outfit. So uh, the Kohinoor sailed on the HMS Medea on the ship, by the way. Yes. From Calcutta. And uh, this was very strange. It had two, uh, a captain and a colonel on it and a very small crew. It didn't carry anything except a single innocuous dispatch box. And uh, it was uncommon for Her Majesty's Navy to be deployed on a mundane company business, but uh, some military vessels accompanied this. So this ship did not reach Port Portsmouth until June 29th. It left Calcutta on April 6th. Uh, and the voyage had cholera, uh, soldiers died. Um, the, uh, then this crew sailed directly into the storms of the Cape of Good Hope. Its crews battled winds for 12 hours before managing to get away. So the diamond had already an inauspicious journey. And then it would land here with Queen Victoria. And you can see the diamond there. Maybe it's personal preference. I think it looked better on the brown people. And then... In 1937, uh, for George VI's uh, coronation, the queen mother had it put in the crown. Remember this dude, that 10-year-old boy, Duleep Singh? See on his uh, uh, immigration documents, it's spelled wrong. That's what happens to our names, they get changed. Uh, at age 15, he set sail for England, and he would also become the pet of Queen Victoria, who wrote, I always feel so much for these poor, deposed Indian princes. She also said of the Punjab uh, Maharaj, those eyes, those teeth are so beautiful. Uh, she converted him to Christianity and paraded him around when he wore Indian clothes to parties and called him the Black Prince of Perthshire. He was separated from his mother, who was uh, incarcerated, and he was e only reunited twice. Once to go to her cremation and spread her ashes. But before that, when he was reunited with her, she finally told him the story of how the diamond had been taken from their family and from the kingdom of Punjab, which set him into this collision course of having affairs, becoming a drunkard. He died in a Paris hotel room alone and impoverished, and he would forever refer to Queen Victoria, who kept him as a pet, as Mrs. Fagan of Stolen Goods. The Kohinoor diamond uh, produces a lot of misery for people who have it. Uh, Nader Shah was assassinated. Uh, Shah Abdali had his face eaten by maggots, yeah. which is, uh, I guess, a new kind of facial that you can get in Marin County. Uh, 
Shah Shuja was deposed and tortured. Uh, Ranjit Singh, of course, violence, uh, cholera. The Duke of London, who started cutting it, died. And the present queen has not worn it even once. The Syamantaka diamond, which I told you about before, uh, in the Bhagavad Puranas, it said, when worn by a clean man, it produces gold, but an unclean person, it undoubtedly prov proves to be fatal. So there was already a legend about it before it became the Kohinoor diamond. So that brings us to modern times. It seems to wreak a lot of havoc on people who have it, and it cuts people off from their countries, it's obtained unfairly, but yet... David Cameron refuses to give it back to India. <laughs> the Prime Minister said, if you say yes to one, meeting stolen artifact, you suddenly would find the British Museum would be empty. Thank you, thank you. Standing ovation from one person, I'll take it. India still wants it back. I don't know if you've ever been to an Indian restaurant and had Kingfisher beer. This is Vijay Malia, who started Kingfisher beer, and then he started an airlines, which went bankrupt because he was spending too much time with the flight attendants, apparently. <laughs> he became a multi-bazillionaire, and he ended up using his wealth to buy back Tipu Sultan's sword, which, uh, which yeah, uh, Narendra Modi had, uh, had said he wanted it back. So he bought it back. An Indian sandwich of the goddess Durga has been obtained from Germany a 900-year-old parrot lady uh, sculpture from Canada, and a bunch of Hindu deities from Australia. The United States, under Barack Obama, gave back a bunch of stolen Indian artifacts as well. So a lot of Indian businessmen now, that the GNP of India is now on the rise, and India is now, again, a global economy, they're thinking maybe this is the only way to get it back. So this is one of my favorite dudes, John Oliver, and this is what he says about the Kohinoor. As for, as for the current prime minister, David Cameron, when he was asked about returning the diamond during a visit to India a few years ago, he simply stated, they're not having that back. <laughs> Which is so petulant and childish a response. I'm surprised he didn't lick the diamonds to call <laughs> official dibs on it. So no licking. Um, but that leaves us with, is there still a curse <laughs> on those who possess the diamond? I didn't understand Brexit for the longest time, but then I read this quote that was really beautiful. It said, England, we understand. You have people coming into your country, changing your culture, living off your economy, changing the things that you value, and making the country almost unrecognizable from the glory it once was. We get it. Love, people of India. Thank you so much. That's been my time.